GM, good morning. Welcome to the Milk Road Show, the daily crypto show that brings more heat than hot pockets fresh out of the microwave. I'm your host, Jay Hamilton, and today we are joined by Anthony Pompolano, Pomp, founder and CEO of Professional Capital Management, prolific investor, business builder, content creator, and author of a new book, How to Live an Extraordinary Life. In today's episode, Anthony's going to walk us through his new book, talk about the lessons within it, and how you can apply it to your investments and honestly, your life. This book is amazing. I read it over the past few days and I highly, highly recommend it. I actually can't wait. I'm going to buy it for everybody in the Milk Road team. It is that good. Pop, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you. Just give us a little bit of background to start off on why did you write this book? Yeah, my wife convinced me to write a letter to uh, our first child when she was born. And I started then thinking about, you know, other than writing about, hey, I love you. Thank you for making me a dad. This is going to be fun. <laughs> and kind of all the normal, you know, fairly simplistic things. It really made me think about what do I want to communicate to my children? You know, God forbid something happens to me. What are the things that I want them to pick up? going into kind of their life. And so I started writing a bunch of letters, you know, two turned into four, turned into eight and somewhere around eight or 10, I decided that maybe I should actually turn this into a book. And one of the things about writing these letters is you're writing for a specific person, right? You know, in this case, my, my two children, but you want to make the lessons as applicable to as many people as possible. And so you need to be specific. You have to communicate very concisely, but you also need to make the lessons memorable. It's not very helpful if you read something, you know, it, it's helpful in the moment, but then you forget it. And so I'd spent a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, how do you communicate these ideas in a simple, memorable way, but also make sure that they could, you know, create positive change in my children's lives and then other people who read the book. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that was so, I mean, first of all, there's so many books out there and you can't read them all. And so many of them are so long. So I appreciate how condensed this book was and how simple it was to read. It's 63 letters. Each one has a very clear message, which honestly, I got to tell you this, Pomp, you're going to love this. I already used one of the chapters earlier today in an interview, in another interview with William Quigley, the co-founder of Tether. I used the, what can I do for you line, which we'll get to that one because that's one of the ones I want to bring up. So today, we're not going to go through all 63. That'd be way too many. I want to go through just a few and want to hear you talk about them and maybe how you think these lessons could apply specifically to investors, which is obviously who's listening to the Milk Road Show. So first up, one of my favorites is buy great assets and hold them forever. Yeah. Timeless investing principle, you know, kind of the classic Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger. One of the things that people will talk about who uh, have done this successfully is every time they sold an asset, it was a mistake. And so if you look at the S&P 500, if you look at you know some of the great companies of today, if you had just bought them and done nothing and just literally held them for a long time, uh, that would be the best investment decision. On top of that, there's this famous study that Fidelity did a couple of, uh, maybe now at this point, 10, 12 years ago. And what they talk about is the two best performing accounts uh, at Fidelity were either people who had lost their password or people who had died. And so there's this idea that as humans, we want control. We want to intervene in the market. We want to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, but holding is an active decision. And so having the discipline to do the work up front, buy a great asset and hold for a long period of time tends to kind of separate financial returns from maybe others. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. Let's go to another one that I really liked, which was rich people sell too early. So what's funny is I put these back to back because they actually contradict each other. And I, that's why I put them up. Side yeah. By side. And so in the intro, I, I just uh, explicitly state, listen, it's really hard to give people advice. And so you should evaluate each letter on its own and understand that some will be complimentary. Others will be contradictory. It's kind of like when and where, right? Context mm -hmm. really matters in giving advice to someone. And so rich people sell too early is this idea that not every asset is a great asset for the long run. Right, You could buy an asset, it goes up over a year, three years, five years, but maybe the circumstances change, maybe the market changes, maybe the facts change. And so selling too early is something that people are always scared of. What if I sell and the asset goes up higher? But you can't really evaluate what is the potential future, quote unquote, like paper loss, right? Or, or like fake loss. Instead, you got to look at if I sell today, what do I gain? And so part of what makes investing really hard is having to decipher the difference between which are the great assets I should hold forever and which are the assets that I'm in the money on and I should sell. And so I'm not claiming it's easy, but I do know that a lot of my rich friends bought great assets and held them forever. And then I got a whole nother cohort of rich friends that 
bought assets and they sold too early. The asset kept going up, but they didn't care because they put cash in their bank account and, you know, they went and they had a great life too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's a great point. I want to go to do it right, do it light. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, probably one of the most important lessons. This like focus on shortcuts, on very quick instantaneous gratification, and this idea that, you know, I don't need to put the work in in order to get the outcome. And so when you see that in society, what you find, though, is most of the people pursuing that strategy end up doing things over and over again. And so I learned this lesson in the military where, you know, they would say, hey, go do X. People would go try to do it. They would rush. They would cut corners or whatever. And then the drill sergeant or whoever in the military would come and say, hey, do it again. And so the saying is do it right, do it light, meaning that if you do it right the first time, you don't have to do tons of reps of it. And so same thing in life in general is simply just when tasked with doing something or trying to attempt something, focus spend the time up front, do it right the first time, and you won't have to go back over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Since this one is really about habits and forming habits, I'm curious if there are any habits around investing that you have formed or that you would advise to others. Frankly, the biggest thing is you're not smarter than the market. And so <laughs> you will think that you are at different points, whether the market is down or up, especially at the extremes, you know, kind of crisis or times of greed. And so building habits is really a way to save yourself from you. And in my experience, one of the best things that you can do is write down your strategy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you can't change the strategy. It doesn't mean that you can't add to the strategy, but simply writing down, I am going to buy X asset. I am going to hold it for a Y time frame. Here are the three things that would make me want to sell the asset. And here are three things that could happen that would make me want to buy more of the asset. Buy, take that piece of paper, stick it somewhere, look at it every day or every week, and then try to operate within that framework. Now, of course, having it written down means that you had to clarify to yourself by thinking thoroughly about what you're doing. So I think that's one big uh, habit. Another big habit is when you are trying to create a portfolio, you want to be able to balance, do you have a very concentrated portfolio or do you have a very diversified portfolio? And do you have a lot of cash flow or do you have a lot of capital appreciation? based on your circumstances. And so one of the things that I see people kind of make a mistake of is they're the type of person who needs high cash flow based on their lifestyle or other responsibilities, but instead they have all of their investments in illiquid uh, kind of opportunities. And so they not only are not getting cash flow, they can't sell the assets that they need when they need them. And so I do think that a great habit is before you even think about your investment portfolio, outline what are the needs that I have for this investment portfolio? I have certain investments where I literally say to myself, I'm buying this and I don't care what the share price does because I know I'm going to hold it for 10 years. My only focus is how do I acquire more shares? So if that's my goal, I probably want something that has high dividends. I then take those dividends and reinvest it so I can acquire more and more shares. I don't worry about the dollar stock price. Mm -hmm. That'll kind of take care of itself over a decade. And so some of these are very simple things that are done up front, but what it does is it really puts yourself in a position to make good decisions when you get to those decision points around what assets do I buy? How do I hold them? How do I allocate them, et cetera? That's fantastic. Excellence doesn't have a watch. Nothing gets built in a quick period of time that ends up being excellent. And, you know, one of the examples I use in the book is uh, skyscrapers. You know, you got to lay the foundation first. But before you lay the foundation, you actually have to go and you have to get an architect to create the plans. They have to get mm -hmm. approved. You have to pick the materials. You have to be meticulous about so many different details. And then only after all that planning do you then get to lay the foundation. And only after you've laid the foundation do you get to build out the frame. And then after the frame, you go and you put you know, the drywall or the windows or the doors. It's that, and then you eventually can build and finish and you know produce something. But a skyscraper may take, you know, in some cases, upwards of a decade to build. And so if you look at the great companies, they took a long time. If you look at many great assets, I mean, take Bitcoin, it's 15 years old. It's mm -hmm. worth over a trillion dollars. That's 15 years. And so I love the Bill Gates quote, like we overestimate what we can do in one year, but we underestimate what we can do in 10. And this idea that like pursue excellence, don't necessarily pursue a time frame exclusively, I think would do people much better than uh, maybe the instant gra uh, gratification world we live in. Yeah. And I think this one is so applicable, especially for investors and especially in today's world where you all you see 
is people saying, I made this much and I did this well. Nobody's talking about their failures. Nobody's gloating about when they lost money or a bad trade they made. And it's important to remember, that's when you get caught, when you try to get that 10, 20, 50x, rather than being patient. Warren Buffett didn't become a billionaire overnight. One of my favorite investors is Ken Langone. He happened to go to the same college I went to, Like, tend to like his uh, very kind of blunt, brash uh, delivery mm -hmm. of ideas. And I tend to think he's on the right side of history. But my favorite stat about Ken Langone is that the average holding period for his portfolio is 42 years. <laughs> 42 years average. And so you don't build a great portfolio overnight. And so he literally has held the different investments in his portfolio for four decades. Excellence doesn't have a watch. And so just focus on the long run, focus on excellence and everything else to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Life is full of power laws. I mean, this is as true as, uh, as any of them in the book. If you think about venture capital investing, it's all a power law game, meaning that if you make 50 investments, maybe one or two actually drive you know, 90, 95% of the returns. You're looking for those kind of asymmetric home runs. And so most people understand what a power law is in an investing context. But if you think about the power law in relationships or in experiences, mm -hmm. you know, take a year on the calendar. You may only go on one trip for one week. That's one week out of 52 weeks in the year. But if that one week is incredible, you'll remember from that year, that one week. And so it's only one week of time investment, but it gave you 95% of the memories of how incredible that year was. And so you see this with things like weddings, birthdays, mm -hmm. maybe a big vacation, et cetera. Relationships are the same way. I have some friends who have literally, they think hundreds of friends, but it's like an inch deep, a mile wide. Instead, my happiest friends, they have like five friends and they have a really, really deep, special relationship with those five people. And they constantly are reinvesting in them. They're compounding. And it's kind of this power law takes over where those five relationships drive more happiness than if they had 500 friends. And so once you see a power law and how it applies to so many different aspects of life, you begin to realize that it's all about, again, excellence, quality, small number of things done correctly, rather than trying to be everyone's friend, have a million investments, or spend all year on vacation. This next one feels like the one I wish that most of the world would understand. It seems so obvious, but for some reason, it's so difficult. And it's spend less than you make. Yeah, this one I put in there because I felt like I couldn't give my kids advice without uh, probably the most basic financial uh, <laughs> lesson. But it also is simple and everyone knows it because it stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. Every investment strategy, you know, debt, credit cards, student loans, mortgages, savings, whatever, all those things kind of come and go. They change. There's dynamic aspects to the market. But one thing that has stood the test of time is just spend less money than you make. And so, again, it goes back to if you want to build a great foundation, actually being able to spend less than you make starts with designing a life that has a certain kind of capital amount allocated every month. So say to yourself, what are the things I really care about, right? If I really like to go out to eat, well, rather than do that every night, why don't I try to do one great meal every other week? Again, power law takes over, right? And so now you're saying to yourself, okay, let me allocate budget to those two nights a month, but everything else I'm going to be very frugal about because I'm essentially earning the right to go out to a really nice dinner every other week. And so I do think that everyone knows spend less than you make, but how you do it is really important. And it's not always, oh, let me just hope that I spend less than I make. It's designing your life correctly. And then the other piece of it is sometimes it's actually easier to make more money than it is to spend less money. And so if you think about, you know, somebody who let's say gets paid $60,000 a year, that's five grand a month before taxes, it may actually be easier for that person to go and make $500 extra on a weekend than it is to convince their boss to give them a 10% raise or to find somewhere in their budget to save $500. And so spending less than you make doesn't always have to be a, a contraction it, or like an elimination. It can be additive. You can just add more income as well to address that equation. Have a bias for action. I don't know anyone who is successful or happy that doesn't have a bias for action. And action doesn't mean that you got to get up every day and try to take on the world to do you know all this incredible stuff. Sometimes actually a bias for action is you have to get up and have the discipline to sit and read 
and to not go outside or check your phone or, you know, go try to find someone to talk to, et cetera. And so it really comes down to like, what is the extraordinary life that you want? What I think is an extraordinary life for me or my family is very different than what somebody else might want. Somebody else may say, you know what? I love going out on Friday night. That is, I look forward all week. That's when I'm happiest is going out with my friends on Friday night. For me, I don't want to do that, but I understand that that is their extraordinary life and mine might be something else. And so when you have this bias for action, it's understanding what are the things I want to do and what are the things I don't want to do. And action is not always a thing that is purely offensive. Sometimes the action, similar to holding is an active decision, is actually having the bias of action of saying no. And so a great example there is how many people get asked things in their life, and when they are asked, they kick the can down the road. But having a bias for action is mm -hmm. request comes in, answer the email immediately, and say no. That is a bias for action that then eliminates things from your calendar, which then frees up your time, which then will make you happy if that's the type of person you are. And so bias for action, I think a lot of people say, oh, it's just being busy. I don't necessarily think that's true. A bias for action can also be saying no to things. It's just doing it in a timely manner that is really trying to fulfill the goals that you have to pursue an extraordinary life. Yeah, wonderful advice. Okay, last two, and then you guys are going to have to go buy the book to read the rest. What can I do to help you? I mean, this question is the most underrated question probably in the world. What can I do to help you is something that I always ask anybody that I meet. And it started when I was much younger and it would catch people off guard. I'm younger. They're older. They're way more successful than me. They have all these resources. But why is this young kid asking, what can they do for me? And so almost for years, every single person would say the same thing. Thanks so much for asking. That's really nice of you, but I don't need anything. And so eventually the example that I use in the book is I asked Robert Kiyosaki, I had him on the podcast. Uh, and at the end of it, I asked him, what can I do to help you? And he said to me, after we had done recording, it seems like you really understand this social media stuff. My team's trying to figure it out. Can you spend some time with them to help them think through it? And that one question led to me building a relationship with a guy who had a ton of respect for. I remember reading his books, learning from him, and had looked up to him too in a weird way as kind of a passive mentor. And so by simply asking him, what can I do for him? Rather than showing up and saying, what can he do for me? It opened up this whole world of possibilities, created this great friendship. And now somebody that you know I continue to respect and look up to is somebody that I can communicate with whenever I want. That's not why I asked the question. It's just what was the natural progression of me genuinely caring about how I could be helpful to him. And so I think that young people or older people, successful or not successful people, whenever you meet people, ask them, what can you do to help them? And if you live that life in service of others, then you will be shocked at all of the value that accrues back to you over time. I want to challenge everybody listening in to ask that question in the next week. Let us know in the comments if you're actually going to do that. Okay, last one, my personal favorite, simplest, one of the simplest ones to do. Call your friends for no reason. Yeah, my friends at first thought this was real weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you ever call one of your friends, especially if you're like have a text relationship with them or like email or you only talk to them when you see them in person, if you just call them and you're like, hey, man, what's up? They'd be like, uh what's going on? And you're like, I was calling to see how you're doing. They immediately are like, is everything okay? Like, you know, like, like they're very suspect, but then once they get used to you doing this, they actually really enjoy it. And what I always explain to people is like, I'm calling friends and I'm seeing what they're up to. I'm trying to catch up on, you know, on their life. I'm trying to make sure they're okay. You know, I want to hear about their family, their kids, their friends, their accomplishments at work, what books they're reading, all this information but I genuinely want the information. I'm not faking it. I want to stay up to date with some of my friends. And so what I find though, is when I get off those calls, I'm incredibly happy. And so there's this really interesting thing of if you live your life and you are not intentional about talking to your friends, you will simply have the world act upon you. And I think one of the biggest lessons, if you kind of look at the commonalities or the throughputs of this book, it just comes back to people have agency. And people who have high agency, they're the ones who get things done. They tend to be the ones who are successful and they tend to be the ones who are happy. And so the world continues to teach all of us that it is going to act on us. It is going to force us into situations or force us to do certain things. But it's the people who have the courage to rebel against those forces and say, I have agency. I can do what I want to do. I can go out there and I can get what I want. 
those are the people who I think really end up leading what their version of an extraordinary life is. And so each one of these chapters reinforces that idea of high agency. And this idea of calling your friends is a great example where you make the phone call. Don't wait for them to call you. You call them, you act genuinely interested, you get the information and you'll be shocked as to how happy it makes you. Everybody listening in, I want to know which of the lessons that we spoke about today speak to you most. Let us know in the comments. And Pomp, before we let you go, what can we, what can the Milk Road team and the Milk Road listeners do for you? You guys did it, man. I appreciate you guys having me on talking about the book. Obviously, you know, I'm spending a lot of time out here. I'm still trying to sell books. So uh, uh, <laughs> first as, time as, selling books. How's it going so far? Well, as people have heard me say now, most people who go for books, they go and they pick targets. They say, I want to sell, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 100,000, million books, whatever. I don't have a number. All I have is a forever goal. I need to sell one more copy than my wife. So anybody who's watching, I need your help. Go buy the book. She sold a lot. I got a big hill to climb, but together we can take her down. So Let's go buy the book. Go. If I sell one more copy than her, she may want to kill me, but okay, I will have achieved my goal. I will be happy and I'll deal with all the fallout from there. Pa Paulina, we'll get you on the show. If Pop sells one more, we'll get you on and then we'll bump you back up. So don't worry about it. Pop, thanks so much again for joining us today. Everybody, make sure you grab the book. Link is in the show notes to pick it up. Have yourselves a wicked awesome day. As always, if you liked today's episode, please hit subscribe and make sure you follow us so you don't miss out on the next one. There's also a link in the description to our free five minute daily newsletter where we simplify crypto for you while making you laugh. And if you're willing to step up your crypto investing game, we're gonna also leave a link for Milk Road Pro. You get access to our portfolio where you can see exactly what we are buying. This is your number one resource to help you invest successfully in crypto. One final note, this show is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Investing in crypto or any asset is risky and you should never invest more than you can afford to lose. Thanks so much for listening in my friends. Have a wicked awesome day.